really the goal is just to use our stories to bring veterinary medicine to life for the pet caretakers of the world. Uh, and we're doing it because we believe that educating these caretakers is the most powerful thing that we can do to improve the life quality of all of the pets that we love. Hello, Dr. Natalie Keith. Dr. Josiah Dame. And this is Vet Tales. Mm -hmm. We are back again trying to like cover some like really common diseases. And boy, howdy, is this one very common? Very common. It's not even the season, and we're having a case once every two weeks. I know it is kind of seasonal, but yet not really. Yeah, it's yeah, it's like do we have one case a week or do we have four cases a week? Yeah. Is the difference between the season and non seasonal. Yeah. And it's an interesting one because recently because there's new medications for it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a good time to revisit this topic. And if you're wondering what we're talking about, it's parvovirus. Yay. Wah, wah. And the cloud go crowd goes wild. Yeah. Parvo is infamous for sure. Yes. And um, yeah. I feel like everybody knows a puppy. Yeah, I was going to say, like, if you don't know what parvovirus is, congratulations, because you are living a very privileged existence, and we're fixing to pop that bubble. Yeah, it's a nasty virus. It is a nasty virus, primarily affecting the most cutest of all veterinary patients, the puppy. Mm -hmm. And it's preventable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so preventable. You know, not not every case is it, like, does it seem like that there was... Like, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I had, like, my sister-in-law one time got a puppy. It had been vaccinated by a breeder, and before she could oh, yeah. re-booster it, it's already getting sick. That's actually the most common story. That is the most common story. Not necessarily the breeder part, but getting the puppy, and then, uh, you know, you've had it for a week. You may have done the first vaccine. But yet. It becomes sick. It yeah. still becomes sick, yeah. And so, you know, not to, you know. While it is preventable, that doesn't mean, like, if your dog gets parvo that you, like, mess up. Yeah, no. No, 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 no. I remember when I first got Ruben, and he was, he was like, six and a half weeks old when I brought him home, I think. And about a week and a half later, so he'd had, like, one shot. But it was, like, a week and a half later, and he got so sick. Like, he threw up, and he started getting, like, this wild diarrhea. I actually took my daughter's, because she was, like, three at the time and had pull-ups still for overnights you know <laughs> so i took a pull-up caught cut a little german shepherd tail hole size hole in the back of it and pulled that tail through and because he was just leaking it was so bad and he was curled up in the little parvo ball you know yeah. and i like and it was the snowstorm so i couldn't get to the clinic and i was beside myself like <laughs> freaking out. Anyway, it turns out it was not Parvo. He just had some really nasty little GI incident. But yeah, I remember just like, yeah, the veterinarian's dog is Parvo. Fabulous. <laughs> 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 Amazing. <laughs> but he didn't. He didn't. So. And that's interesting because the whole six week thing. So when you have, so kind of why we do the parva vaccine three times and the way we do it so we or four follow, or four but we do a <clears throat> 8 12 16 week protocol sometimes puppies get shots at six weeks and then we go you come for eight week appointment and we go okay we're starting the vaccines again and then yep. i will definitely talk to everybody on why yeah so mother's antibodies will negate those vaccines and you're trying to catch the window of susceptibility and so essentially mom's antibodies will continue to negate those vaccines. So that's going to be probably at six weeks, the vaccine's not going to do anything. Eight weeks, maybe it will, maybe it won't, because mother's antibodies should still be there. And then you get to the 12 and the 16 weeks, those should amount an immune response. Yeah, and it, it depends on puppy to puppy, even within the litter, versus also like how many antibodies did the mom have versus the puppies, each puppy's Access So, like, the first puppy might get more antibodies than the last puppy born, and then their own immune systems, how they, you know, handle that. And so there's so many variables, and that's why we have to cover such a, a big span of time. Yeah, and then the incubation period for Parvo, so once they've had contact with it, how long is it going to take for them to get sick? Usually I tell people, like, 7 to 10 days Yeah, is, like, my Yeah, it can be as soon as 5. Yeah. Like, textbook, I think, is 5 to 7, but you will see up to 10. Yeah, 
I feel like I've seen it. From I've looked at timelines. From infection to detection. Is yeah. that what we're talking about? Yeah. yeah, yeah. From infection to detection. And how do they typically present? Oh, man. <laughs> so typical puppies are dull, depressed, lethargic, or DDL, as we call it in our notes. Mm-hmm. And they have vomiting and bloody diarrhea. Like that's your classic puppy. They don't want to eat or drink. They're just laying there curled up in a little ball. Not always. So you can have any number of those symptoms, Mm -hmm. but like your classic hallmark, like this is textbook definition. We're still going to test you, but we know. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, Ruben had all of those symptoms except for the blood in his stool. So he had diarrhea, vomiting, and severe lethargy. So, you know, it wasn't in his case, but um, you can have, or or what will happen is owners will see one of the three symptoms and the other ones haven't yet started. Mm-hmm. And so you can get a lot of gray area there. And something I tell owners, and you might too, is, you know, sometimes it gets better. I mean, it gets worse before it gets better. Yeah, because absolutely. Because a lot of owners do catch it early and they'll, and I, again, we ask to run these tests and here's why, because we'll have a puppy come in with just regular old diarrhea and but my rule of thumb with any puppy who is not you know even sometimes above the 16 week final vaccine has already been given but my rule of thumb is you're getting a parvo test you're getting a fecal mm-hmm. and that's the test i'm starting with 100 having vomiting yeah. or it's hospital diarrhea. policy yeah the text yeah. now any puppy any dog under a year of age has to have a parvo test in a fecal if they present with gi signs yep exactly and so we test it and You'd be shocked at some of them with the mild mm-hmm. symptoms they have mm-hmm. are parvo positive. And then I have to like go to the owner and be like, okay, you probably got it early. It's probably going to get a little bit worse before it gets better. We need to hospitalize if you can. Yeah. And it's also frustrating too because, I mean, just like any virus, you know, I don't want to like call it any virus as COVID, but, you know, there's this wide spectrum of clinical symptoms based mm-hmm. on a, an individual's immune response. So, and let's say you have a puppy litter of like 12 puppies and they all get exposed to the same exact environmental situation. They all have the same mom that, you know, the same everything. And you might have one puppy that just like dies and you might have three puppies that have to be hospitalized. You might have two puppies that get mild symptoms and everybody else never showed a single sign. Yeah. And that and they may all test positive for Parvo. Mm-hmm. So really Parvo is about managing symptoms yeah exactly and the that's <laughs> i struggle with that because when you're trying to make that estimate and you're like timeline it could just be so variable and the mm-hmm. puppy that looked really good when it came in a day later could look awful mm-hmm. and then you have to be like i'm sorry but it's going to be probably longer than what we maybe talked about yeah that's why i've i've now taken upon the saying you know it's going to probably get worse before it gets better yeah yeah and then if it doesn't that's amazing but it is true that typically when they catch them early like i almost there's this part of me when the puppy comes in already really sick Mm -hmm. i'm like okay at least i know what i'm working with yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) we're at the valley we just got to work our way back up up to the mountain yeah that's right (laughs) (laughs) so yeah it's definitely because when the when the puppies are pretty bright it's like it's really hard to tell owners like it's expect it to get worse like Mm -hmm. but you're putting it on fluids now you're starting the medicine now like shouldn't that stop it and it's like not really because all we're doing is supporting the immune system Mm -hmm. except for what go ahead what else are we doing now that is intervening in the process oh and now and well i was gonna yes so there's a new medication from a long no it, it is. It's Alonco. It is okay, Alonco. Cool. It's yeah. from Alonco, which is a, a drug company. They make a monoclonal antibody now, which is like the new thing in What's human the name and of it? Medi- medicine. I think it's just parvovirus monoclonal antibody. Okay, that's funny. I yeah. was like, because I was, I was like, do they have a name? I don't. Know. Like, <laughs> I don't think they do. Oh gosh, so many facts. I don't look at the box very long because it's like keep in the freezer. <laughs> I'm like go <laughs> back. So. Sadly, well, not sadly, but it, it it it's expensive, but it has been pretty awesome to see how well a lot of the, the puppies respond to the medication. The studies for it are pretty spectacular. So, you know, a lot of puppies are doing very well with it. And essentially, you're just giving them more immunity to fight the virus. And so that is very nice. Yeah. So you end up sometimes saving 
money by by and you know stress and and disease for your pet yeah it is canine parvovirus monoclonal antibody that is the name of cpma is is what they're you know they just say, i kind of respect this i respect that Me because too. some of these disease these drug names like i'm like what, are what? You? Are, why i'm not gonna say what i'm thinking yeah <laughs> <laughs> But it, it's been really great. I've used it on quite a few patients now, and it has seemed to shorten hospital stays in most of my parvo patients. There are still some outliers, obviously, that are going to be here longer, even if they get it. But I did tell the owners for those, I'm like, I'm glad that we gave it because I don't want to see them without it. You're right. They probably wouldn't have lived. Or yeah. if they did, it would have been eight days in hospital instead of instead four. Instead of four. Or exactly. whatever. And that's the one I'm thinking of. But yeah, I've had a couple where I've Yeah, that puppy them. got really bad respiratory stuff, though. That was the one that also got like aspiration pneumonia secondary. Oh, or was I'm, that a different one? I'm talking about the most recent one, actually, that was like last week. Oh, okay. That was very mild the whole time, but just didn't want to eat. So we ended up having him for four mm. days. And yeah, but okay. he finally rebounded. And I think he just missed his mom. <laughs> Because we were like, hey, like, come just get him and see what happens. Because he's fine. Like, he's stable. He's just not wanting to eat. And then, like, he went home and was perfectly fine. And yes. I was like, okay, you just missed your mom. <laughs> and some adorable. of those, I feel like that, that happens. Cats but, especially. <laughs> yeah. And so, with, with the really bad ones, uh, we hospitalize and do that. We recommend hospitalization for all parvo patients. But there is some financial situations where sometimes we can't hospitalize. We are still pushing to give the monoclonal antibody because for my outpatient parvo patients who are like going home because, you know, financially hospitalization is not going to happen. They have been doing very well mm -hmm. with the monoclonal antibody. Yeah, I mean, board. historically, the, the statistics that kind of rang true for us were that a parvo puppy with symptoms that received no care, only 10 percent would survive. If they just were like left to tough it out, if they received go home care, we had a 40 percent survival rate mm -hmm. and in hospital, we had about 85 percent survival rate, which yeah. is actually pretty good. It is. But now with the monoclonals, we're actually seeing the, you know, the go home numbers come up, come up significantly as well as in hospital. Yeah. And again, the big thing is they're decreasing their treatment duration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, nothing's 100 percent. No, it's not. But. We have seen with the outpatients, I've been shocked at how well they've done mm -hmm. with the monoclonal antibody. And then obviously we're still going to do our supportive care because yeah. you can't you can't get away from that. Um, in the studies, they didn't give them supportive care and they still they had to go through it a little bit, but they they still a lot. Most of them survived. Interesting. I didn't I didn't realize. I have to look at the numbers, but yeah. they only gave the monoclonal antibody and a lot of them did really well in the studies, too, which that's not going to happen with us. We're going to. You know, that was because they have to see all the variables out of that situation. Mm -hmm. But we're going to give that and supportive care. And the ones I've had, some of them have bounced back within 24 hours at home. And some of the hospitalization patients have gone home the next day. Which is also scary because then you're like, are you going to crash Yes, tomorrow? because here's the thing. Every parvo patient, even with the monoclonal antibody, I always tell owners, they may relapse. And so if that happens, just call us, tell us, and bring them back. Okay, yeah. And, you know, that's my, yeah. always my little caveat. But yeah. So why does parvo have to seem to seem to run its course? Yeah. Like, what about that disease? Yeah, let's just talk about what's actually happening in the body with parvovirus. Yeah. I think that's a great starting place. Because... So yeah, the, what physically is happening is why it just sometimes takes a while. Yeah. So essentially, the virus is invading and replicating within cells of the body that are very fast turnover times. Mm -hmm. So that primarily is a digestive tract. You actually can find them in the tongue as well, which is just so <laughs> weird to me. But ugh. anyway, the mo the most affected area is actually the proximal intestine, so which would be the intestines that are closest to the tummy. Mm -hmm. And it basically is causing all those cells in that top layer to just die. Yeah. And then they slough off meaning just shed off almost like a sunburn is kind of like but deeper and it's happening on the inside of the intestine due to that cell death and so these dogs are suffering many issues from that so obviously it hurts uh -huh. so that's a thing they've got massive nausea because of the inflammation of the digestive tract and it's right next to the pancreas as well so we're getting like pancreatic inflammation and then we're obviously not absorbing anything. 
So we can't really absorb oral medications because that's the proximal absorption site is right post stomach because the stomach breaks it down and the proximal intestines absorb the nutrition. And then as you get down the line, then the colon's in charge of like water resorption and so forth. Um, So these dogs are not taking up oral medications or nutrition. A lot of times they're vomiting back out any liquids that they're taking in. So we're having severe dehydration. And then that breach of the barrier of the small intestines with all the cell death is causing permeability where bacteria that should just be in the gut is now being taken up into the bloodstream. Yeah. And the cells that were destroyed, it takes a minute for those to come back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, seven days to yeah, ge- regenerate so. a layer. And so, you know, no matter what, you know, if you've already had the death of these cells or the, you know, the, the, the potential death, so the, the virus is within the cells, now the cells that have that, even if you stop everything else. The cells that have that virus are still going to die. You're still going to slough. You're still not going to absorb until that barrier is is repaired. And you're going to have this potential uptake of bacteria and secondary septicemia, which is infection. And that takes seven days for those cells to come back. So in theory, we should be telling everyone we're hospitalizing for seven days. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) in theory. But, you know, your goal is once they're... your goal is to get them out. (laughs) Yeah, once they're rehydrated and able to take in... And hold down their oral medications and yeah. nutrition, then, yeah. I have to tell myself that, the seven-day thing, because I'm like, take the pressure off. Yeah. So if it's well, going to take longer for them. Yeah. If we can it's... just, like, you know, I like to sneak behind the curtain just every now and again. And I find that, in general, owners are like, they lose all hope if a dog has to be hospital more, hospitalized more than three days. And I'm yeah. like, that's not like because i feel it too i'm like why it's been three days yeah. <laughs> you know but that's not actually how the body works and like what we, we wouldn't give up hope if a person was in the hospital for three days yeah exactly you know like pancreatitis and people they'll be in the hospital for weeks yeah and we have had some pancreatitis dogs who are pancreatitis. seven eight days and we yeah. start to panic. panic as panic. veterinarians we're like we have three days to fix yeah. this <laughs> 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 before they pull the plug on our treatment plan. I know. So, yeah. So, anyway, so it's a little bit of pressure. But in in all technicality, it, why would the dog be better in less than seven days? Yeah. You know, depending yeah. on the amount of trauma that happened. Mm-hmm. So, that is kind of the, the parvo treatment and the what parvo does. Yeah. Well, and we if we were going to elaborate on supportive care. Yeah. Elaborating on supportive care, we're going to do medicated fluids. So that includes, you know, dextrose in the bag, which is basically just sugars, minerals, vitamins also in the bag. And that just helps them for supportive Support, care. Yeah, because they can't absorb things. Right yeah. Now. And so we're giving them basically mini IV nutrition kind of. And then not literal IV nutrition. But and then on top of that, we're going to be doing IV metronidazole, which y'all all probably know. That is our like anti-diarrheal antibiotic. And then on top of that, we'll do another antibiotic and to kind of stretch that spectrum of coverage. And yeah, then fight off different kinds of bacteria, essentially. And then like anti-nausea medication. Yeah. And appetite stimulants. If it's been a day or two, we'll probably start an appetite stimulant. In very extreme cases, you know, feeding tubes may be placed. Yeah, because you do, what will happen is if you go a certain amount of days without eating is that s- the cells in the intestinal lining, even if they didn't get affected by the virus, will start to shrivel up and die. Yeah. And then you got to regenerate those guys. Mm-hmm. And so getting some liquid nutrition down them after, you know, a period of 48 hours or, you know, ideally before 72. Mm-hmm. And, you know, fancy word ileus, which is where it just means the GI tract not really moving. Yeah, that just the stagnant. Too, and then that is not fun. Those are the ones that get stuck here Mm -hmm. for seven, eight days when the GI tract won't start contracting and moving again. It just sits there and fills up like an empty balloon. Because then you have to play the game of is the GI tract not moving or has something more catastrophic happen like intussusception, which is another big word of the day. But intussusception is where basically if your intestinal tract was a tube sock with both ends cut off so that it was like one opening or like leg warmers. Yeah, there we go. (laughs) And you kind of fold it in on it on itself until it looks almost like a cinnamon roll. That is into susception. And that's what happens to the GI tract because it's not moving well or it just starts to move in one spot, but not the other locations. Kind of like slinky on top of it. And then it creates an obstruction. 
yep. essentially of the intestine. And in a severe case, yeah, like it'll actually cut off its own blood supply because it yep. gets so tight. And then you have to resect that entire area. It's awful. Those are the worst cases. Yeah. You know, we would try to diagnose that via ultrasound or, or radiographs to see, you know, you know, or do we have a, an obstructive pattern going on? But very, very tough when that starts to happen. Luckily, rare. Very, yeah. The interception part, the the ileus, we do see. Yeah. Not that uncommonly. Mm-hmm. Maybe what, like, ten percent of parvo cases. Yeah, I'd probably say like a year. Yeah, so maybe less than ten percent. Yeah, I, I've typically I've seen it a year. The ileus. Yeah. No, the the. Oh, the interception. That's, that makes more sense. Ileus, yeah. very common. Yeah, il- yeah, ileus. I feel like. Yeah, maybe 10 percent Hard for course, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it really is. It just, some of them get so severe that we're having to, like, like do an enema to release the liquid out so that the body doesn't over-distend. And it's, it's like, a really unpleasant experience for everyone. We actually did a fecal transplant on one not too long ago where we reintroduced. Remember when we took Max's poo? God love him. He did a poo donation. And this is summer. I don't, how are you? She now? wasn't part of Oh, it wasn't a part of No, but she would basically should have been. Yeah. <laughs> I just, wish she would have been. It would have been a good It was good just answer. a different Ilias kind of thing or something. She ate a whole car. <laughs> she was a pound oh, yeah. dog. She ate like a whole carcass and of, something. of something. And she she thankfully passed. And but she was a young puppy. Bones, so yeah, young puppy. But she broke with the worst bloody diarrhea and she had it. She was here for two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So we ended up doing it, which you can do. I have done it on Pervos too, but I think it was just before you were back here. And you actually just take the poo of a dog (laughs) that's healthy and reintroduce it into the rectum of a sick dog to give them good bacteria and microbiome to replace, you know, because bacteria are really important in that in that process. And so... Yeah, and she actually got better. She sure did. She really did. Yeah, Max just saving lives, <laughs> stalking him till he poos. <laughs> uh, but yeah, part anyway. of that stinks. Yes, literally. And also, yeah. it does actually have a really distinct odor too. So sometimes we can diagnose the parvo just from the smell. Just be like, this is. Bad. It's really interesting. This is a total tangent, but it's just a fun fact. If you're still listening, you if you have earned fun facts of the day. There's a lot of diseases we diagnose by smell. Mm. Like transitional cell carcinoma has a really specific smell. <laughs> Azotemia when it gets really bad. So yeah. failure. Diabetes can, can have a certain smell. I can smell a cat's mouth and, and be like, yeah. Yeah, this is and this dogs. is kidneys. I've yeah, done it a couple times, but yeah, you get and then this is not something you necessarily diagnose by smell, but hit by cars have a very distinct odor. Really? Yeah, you haven't noticed that. Like I, you can, have a you have like a I have a very s- sensitive sniffer. So does Grayson. It's really interesting. Really? Yeah, yeah. And I'm not. I'm, he will identify I, things by their smell. All I can do is azotemia but it has to be I ha- yeah this awful i feel like but like creatinine above four and that's when i start to smell it interesting and yeah like, if it if i can smell it i know it's going to be pretty severe yeah. azotemia mm-hmm. yeah that's so interesting yeah but yeah it's it's definitely gangrene's another really specific smell oh, yeah we had that one dog with the fracture oh yeah that was not good no yeah anyway but it's okay antibiotics woo. yeah woo. yeah <laughs> <laughs> parvo puppies when we do hospitalize them you'll you'll probably notice if you have come and visited a parvo puppy they are in an isolation and so we we really put them in the back yeah they have their own separate area of hospital that you like never have to walk through for any other reason other than to go tend to them because, because it's catchy it's so catchy and there's puppies coming into our hospital so we have to yeah, keep, yeah and then we have like safe. designated a hospital tech that is only dealing with the parvo <laughs> or animals that aren't susceptible like other cats or that kind of thing because it doesn't cross species and if your dog is fully vaccinated and above a year old it is highly 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 mm-hmm. unlikely if not nearly impossible, but you can't say that yeah. for them to get parvo. And something I wanted to mention was that under year protocol, yeah. we have to have that because I, it'll sneak you. It'll you know. be tricky. And yeah. it's really frustrating. Yeah. Cause I've been, I've been, I've been caught before. Yep. And I've beat myself about it because I had mm-hmm. a parvo puppy that was fully vaccinated, five months old, and I didn't test it. Yeah. And this is it just happens. me talking about myself. And, <laughs> I, you know, sent home 
oral medications and then she got worse through the night and went to an ER and they proper tested her and she was positive and I was like are you mercy yeah it's you it, can't trust yeah. you can't they told us in vet school you like you can't trust the vaccines but you you have to you have to you have testing at hand you need to test it because breakthrough happens yeah and it's you know certain vaccines are more notorious for breakthrough than others but they told us in vet school they said you know what's your top rule out if you have a puppy with vomiting diarrhea and you're like parvo and then they're like what about if the dog has been vaccinated and you're like parvo and they're like yeah and they're like what if the test is negative but it has all the symptoms of parvo and you're like parvo <laughs> everybody gets through and it's great because it's a symptomatic treatment so yeah. even if you might be wrong if the test is negative but yeah you always check and then also if they are positive and they have been vaccinated by a veterinarian please for the love of butter stop getting vaccines from the feed store this is my soapbox those vaccines are not always handled properly they don't have the same guarantees they don't have the same shipping protocols some of these vaccine companies are not as good at adding all the strains to because there are multiple strains of parvo mm -hmm. and so some of them don't cover all the strains and so there is massive breakthrough with with feed store vaccines they don't count in my mind so anyway, that being said, if you're getting them from a veterinarian, um, so let's say you're, you've got a 14-week-old puppy that's had two vaccines and it does come up positive for Parvo, they will cover that treatment to the nth degree. Yeah. Insurance. And it's get, like, yeah, it's like insurance and also get insurance. And also get insurance. But also it's like insurance. And yeah. there's a lot of things at, that through our drug companies, they do cover if they're supposed to cover it. Yeah. And so like, you know, we've. I this summer had a eight month old parvo patient. Yeah. Who I was just like, it's protocol, we're gonna test her. And we tested her. Especially and, the Rottweilers. She, yeah. And and she was she was a blue. Okay. Head, yeah. Um like Max. But we, we tested her and boom, parvo positive. And so no, she did not need to be hospitalized as hospitalized as long because she was vaccinated. So she so had she some kind of kind of early immunity. immunity, yeah. But we hospitalized her and it because she was a larger dog at seven months. It was covered by the vaccine mm -hmm. company and she was vaccinated at a different clinic, but we were able to get those records. Yeah. Plus our records. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be like you don't have to be at the same vet. Yeah. You just have to get the records from the vet that gave the vaccines and then whatever company they use is the one that will help pay for the hospital care. And they paid for it. They do. Yeah. They they do. And then there's other examples of that, too. If you're pup is Bordetella, which is kennel cough and influenza vaccinated. We can send off PCRs yep. that, you know, if they come back positive, treatment is covered and the PCR is covered, which is like testing for do they have Bordetella? Like, why are they coughing? Yeah. And then some other ones with like intestinal parasites, like we talked yep. about, they'll the, do some coverage. Yep. So Yeah. If you've got like ProHeart, for example, and your dog comes down with intestinal parasites, they will cover the treatment yep. for the intestinal parasites. So there's the there's a lot of benefits by, you know, going through your veterinarian to get those fruit things done because it doesn't have to be us just take yeah. your pet to a vet <laughs> yeah as opposed to the feed store we have no guarantees yeah. no no support yeah early exactly. that's the point of that i want to circle back on the hospital and house protocols so there's another protocol that this hospital has that dr trussell created <laughs> That began a long time ago, once upon a time, before we opened Northside, we were working in another clinic together and there was this, this, so there's a punchline that I've already kind of alluded to because of the topic, but it's a six-year-old chihuahua and he comes in and he's got this vomiting and diarrhea and we're running, you know, the lab work and it looks pretty good and we can't figure out and we got him on fluids and he's not getting better. And then it looks like he's got some kind of obstructive pattern. Right. Mm -hmm. And so eventually and this is this is back in the day, folks, y'all. So we we only had one technician between the two doctors at this point and he left at two o'clock every day. Mm -hmm. So after two o'clock, Dr. Trussell and I would trade off between like I would hold his dog to be the tech for him. And then he on my case, he would like, you know, be the tech for me. Mm -hmm. So on and so forth. Well, now it's 8 p.m. and we got to take this dog to surgery. So it's just him and I. We got this dog down on the, the surgery table. We start the surgery and I'm standing there as the assistant, you know, taking vitals and all this. And I'm looking and I said, huh, you know, that looks a lot like... <laughs> a lot like parvo puppies like on necropsy because i'd been a pathology student you know so i'd seen a lot of unfortunately passed away puppies on necropsy and i was like it looks like it looks like parvo on that necropsy old yeah the yeah. you know cranial like and int proximal intestines and you know just hmm. and he stops like like freezes like i have just said freeze <laughs> <laughs> and he looks at me and i look at him and i was like oh no he's like i don't know get a test 
this <laughs> dog's on the table. And I do the, so part of the test is just a Q-tip, the sample of fecal material that you so just like can put it in the, in the rectal, like, you know, opening and or get poop and test the poop. And so sure enough, that sucker was positive. Mm -hmm. And so we promptly sewed him up and we treated him as Parvo with Parvo expectations, you mm -hmm. know? So, okay, we're three to five days in this situation now and we know exactly what we're dealing with. And six years he old. was six years old, but did not have vaccines that were current. Yeah. I don't know if he had him as a puppy, but like this dog hadn't been in the vet in like yeah. three or four years. So. Even without vaccines, statistically, uh -huh. they should have immunity by one year, I think is what. I, be, yeah, because either they're going to get it or die, I guess. Yeah, because it's so ubiquitous. It's yeah, you can't avoid it, which is creepy to think about that, like your dog at any given stage, if you have a dog, is routinely being exposed to parvo and just not getting sick because they have immunity. Yeah. This dog didn't. And I've actually seen it in a 12 year old as well. Wow. Yeah. She was a larger kind of shepherdy mix, also hadn't been to the vet in a long time. I mean, I say shepherdy mix, but she was like maybe 45 pounds or yeah. something. So smallish dog. But Anyway, she did live, but it was a rough go. And yeah, so vaccinate, keep your dogs vaccinated. We don't recommend every year vaccines on Parvo anymore. It's every three years once they get mm -hmm. through their puppy and one-year-old shots. So we go to every three years. But certainly as they age, don't stop doing them because we still will see it. Mm -hmm. And their immunity. Yeah. Yeah. Starts to, to wane a little bit. So yeah. Seems just, just like almost with, more important with older people when they're like, you know, insist that they get the flu vaccine. Yeah. It's like, that's why. Yes. Because your immunity and your ability to fight off things just in general is just not as you, that you need more supportive care to fight through things. So. Mm -hmm. And fun fact to just end it probably. Since yeah. Yeah. I think we're wrapping up. We fun are. fact the tests we use in clinic does not cross-react with the vaccine. And yeah. so what that means is a lot of people bring that up, even clients, because they're like, well, they were vaccinated last week. Yeah, some tests that does matter, not the parvo. So if they have parvo and they test positive, they have parvo. Yep. Yeah, and you can kind of on some some people will occasionally use that parvo test to actually check for pain leukopenia in cats because mm -hmm. it will cross-react with that. Yes. But it's not like a, a dead ringer for it. I would rather rely on my CBC to yes. diagnose pan loop for a cat. But which the reason for that being CBC on parvo and pan leukopenia cats, you'll see a drop in their neutrophil count. Yeah, and that's pretty classic. Yeah, and so like we said, if you have a negative parvo test but you have the symptoms and you have a CBC with a low neutrophil, yeah, well maybe it's still parvo, and you're still going to treat it as yes. if you're basically going to say, okay, well let's be precautious in case it is contagious. We're going to you know isolate it. And then we're going to treat the symptoms because that's really where you're left with regardless. Is, exactly. You know, whether it was from Parvo or a different virus or a different, like maybe a coli could potentially manifest that way mm -hmm. and zap their little neutrophils mm -hmm. down and, you know, things like that. So a lot of it is just supportive care. Yeah. Vaccinate your pets. Vaccinate. Yeah. At a veterinarian and get insurance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're here to help. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool, cool, cool. Okay, I think that's all I've got today. Same. Okay, we've we've depleted our brains. The building looks amazing. Yeah, for um, those of you who are local, capsule. it's February twenty first, and it looks practically done. It does look from the outside; it really does. Other than we're getting ready to pour the concrete in the front, mm -hmm. but man, will I be excited to start seeing the like cabinets go in mm -hmm. and stuff like that. We've we've got about five weeks till hopefully we get a co. Very excited. Yeah, we are. We've been such good sports about the trailer up until about two weeks ago, and we all like hit this plateau. <laughs> <We're all laughs> yeah, it's like things that like the doors are starting to not work. Well, in right like day. the snow really got me. I think. Yeah, because <laughs> we have that tarp between the two trailers, and and so the snow landed on the tarp, and so then pretty. it was yeah, and then it was sunny the next day. So it was sunny everywhere, but where we have to walk all day, and it was raining snow, and it was so cold, <laughs> it was and like, it was going down. My it was like an ice shirt. shower and like you started doing this thing like i felt like a little bit like i was like in a mario game <laughs> where i would like time the drops i would watch to see like when are they gonna fall and then i would like make my steps strategically to yeah. not get rained upon <laughs> yeah i don't want to be in one building yeah so yeah our time is is nearing if y'all are getting over the trailers so are we yeah it's right yeah but it's been we've been grateful for them but boy howdy will we be grateful to be done i had one client yesterday go i they were like when's opening and i was like april 20th and they're like, oh, gay. 
middle of tornado season. And I said, don't say it. <laughs> How dare you? Don't speak the word. <laughs> I had a client yesterday that was like, so you guys just decided to remodel? That's interesting. How did you get the trailers? <laughs> I was like, where have you been? <laughs> so. But in their defense, they only come in once a year with their cat and yeah. they don't do social media or anything like that. So they were completely oblivious. I was like, this was not a choice. This is not a choice. They were like, why did you, why did you decide to quit your boarding facility and move into the boarding building? And I was like, let me tell you a quick story. Once upon a time, April 19th, By the grace of God, <laughs> yeah. the boarding facility was empty. No doubt. Not only was it empty because we had shut down grooming or boarding right before the tornado. Which like was literally, planned. That we, we, the last dog left on Monday. We planned to shut it down Monday, and which we did. And then Wednesday, the tornado happened. And so we had went, a, oh, we have, we have a place. <laughs> we have a place. And so, yeah, we, we moved in one day. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That'll be a story we tell for many years to come. Have you done a tornado podcast yet? No, we should. Just recounting your yeah. sister story? Yeah, I think we definitely should, just for funsies. <laughs> for, for, for the clients in the future who are like, I guess these new fees are why we have such a fancy building. <laughs> I don't know why they had a country accent. But they <laughs> no, terrible. it's because a F3? I think that was an F3, but it was, it, you know, I think it's what's interesting is if that it sucker, hit the ground. yeah, if that sucker had dropped, it would have been an F5 because okay. it was a mile and a half wide. Yeah. But they said it hovered 20 feet off the ground and then just occasionally would like <laughs> suck yeah. things up and spit it out. So scary. The photos that came out. And then my brother is a police officer and he was taking care of the neighborhood next to the clinic. And I called him and I said, is Northside there? And he said, it is not. <laughs> and I said, not. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's it. It's official. Our next podcast is going to be the tornado retelling. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you weren't even there. No, I, I had. I may have to get Dr. Trussell in on I that. I had one. signed a contract to work here, and I went. I, there's not a building. Yeah, <laughs> I bet yeah. unsell my house in Texas. Yeah, he called me, and I was like, "It's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. We're fine. I it's said, fine. You're still coming. My house in Texas is sold." <laughs> All right, he's like, "It's okay. If not, like I can get a job in the city." And yeah. I was like, "Nope." We're fine. It's fine. And it was. It was fine. Thank God you showed up when you did. Praise the Lord. Okay. All right. That's it. That's the end of today. All right. Bye, okay, guys. Bye.